Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 11th of April. I'm Robert Bowick, and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, bankers rigging Australian Senate Glass-Steagall inquiry. Get them out. And countdown to economic Armageddon. But Craig, before we get started, as of this morning, we're shooting a day early today. It's as of this morning, Thursday, Scott Morrison has called the election. It's on. Now, <laughs> I, how, can, how can we get excited, Robbie? I'm thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I do want to point out that so far, all the discussion is around rubbish like electric cars, right? Is anyone hearing any discussion about the financial crisis Australia is plunging into? No. Right? Total, they just don't want to talk about it. Now, we're going to go through a lot of details on that in this show, but this is, the, this is sort of an example of what we've got to change and bring reality to bear on these types of elections. And of course, that's what the CEC is doing. We'll be running Senate candidates in every state. And right? some House of Reps candidates. And some House of yeah. Reps candidates. But definitely, everyone can vote for the CEC in the Senate, wherever you are. So look out for us there on those great big wide sheets. We'll, we'll have a number there somewhere. And our logo on the top. And our logo, yeah. that's right. Um, and as usual, before we begin, what we're going to go through, the details are in the weekly Australian Alert Service magazine. We can't do justice to all the subjects in the time we have for the show. Um, so if you want to know more about a subject and you haven't done it before, call in on our toll-free number and get a free copy of this. All right, And then you, you can have the backup stuff. And you can get on, onto our website as well, where we've got lots of press releases that back this up. All right, so first, bankers rigging Australian Senate Glass-Steagall inquiry. Get them out. So we've got this inquiry underway, Craig. The deadline for the submissions closed tomorrow, yes. right? the, the, uh, the 12th of April. So far, they're just going through the motions. But before we get into the details of that, I want to announce, you know, th this is not a, um, an obscure idea that we've, we've, that we've sort of patched together and, and said, you know, oh, let's, what, if, what if we can do this? This is a big, there's a big movement around the world pushing Glass-Steagall. And the latest example of that is today on the floor of the US House of Representatives, Representative Marcy Kaptur, a Democrat, tabled the 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act in the current US Congress, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a big, sh that's part of the, that's the bill they're pushing there to bring back the Glass-Steagall separation of banks. They've had bills before, Robbie, but they expired when the Congress, uh, you know, itself expired. That's right, it expires. Now people are also, Craig, people are asking about that in terms of our bill, mm -hmm. the separation of banks bill before the US Senate. Does it expire now that the, the election's been called? No, it doesn't because the Senate is not dissolved. The, the mm -hmm. House of Reps is dissolved, not the Senate. So the bill stays there. And this inquiry can continue as well, and we'll, we'll talk about that now. Um, the problem is not the timing of the election. The problem is this inquiry, as we put out in a press release this week, Craig, is being chaired by a banker, yeah. Senator Jane Hume. Now, her own staff, some CEC, we were informed by people, CEC was informed by you know, people who are Glass-Steagall supporters who went to Jane Hume's office um, and asked about Hume's conflict of interest as a banker, her own staff denied she was a banker. Well, they should have got onto her, her um, parliamentary biography, which lists there that she's a real banker. She was the investment research manager at NAFM, which is a subsidiary of National Australia Bank from 1995 to 98. She was a private banker at National Australia Bank from 98 to 99. She was senior manager Rothschild Australia from 99 to 2003. And she was the vice president of Deutsche Bank from 2008 to 2009. So she's a banker. The, uh, another Liberal on the committee, Senator Arthur Sinodinus, is also a banker. He went from being John Howard's Chief of Staff to he went to work for NAB while they were in um, opposition and he's come back as a, as a um, he's back in Parliament now. But he's, so he's a banker. There's a third banker on the committee, which we have to mention just because we're singling them out, which is the Green Senator, Peter Wish-Wilson. However, Peter Wish Wilson, unlike the other bankers on the committee, is prepared to criticise the banks, mm -hmm. right? He's trying to be even-handed. He also wasn't associated with Australian banks, right? He worked on Wall Street. Um, what's, so what's stunning, Robert, here is back in February of last year, in 2018, right, this committee was responsible for pushing through the APRA legislation that's right. that gave Australia effective bail-in. That is where, you know, if the banks and when the banks get into trouble, through the regulators, they have the access, they can actually take people's deposits. Now, everyone says, oh, no, that's not possible. People are lying about you. The CC's lying about that and so forth. But we've done the work. And in particular, this is an excellent article in this Australian Alert Surf written by Solicitor Bob Butler that goes through a legal opinion. definition, a legal opinion, 
that Australian deposits can be bailed in. It's this committee, yep. led by these bankers, that are covering the arse of the they government stamp that for through. the benefit of the bankers. So no, one, no wonder nothing is happening in terms of Glass-Steagall or separation of the country. So Craig, country. that's true, but let me point this out, because this, this is a fundamental point. They did that before the Royal Commission. Yes. Now, before the Royal Commission, bankers ran the show completely. Everyone knows that. The government just refused to um, subject them to an inquiry until they're finally forced to, right? They looked the other way uh, from ye of, of years and years and years of banker abuse, misconduct, cr actual crimes, right? And lied, oh, our banks are the best in the world, all this stuff. The Royal Commission showed all that to be totally false, hmm. right? What's really damning is this same committee is behaving the same way after the Royal Commission. It's as if that didn't happen. And, and it's particularly disgusting that there's now been, and it's not just this committee, there's another Senate committee I'll talk about, that there's, there's, there's been two banking issue Senate inquiries post the Royal Commission. Both of them have just, are just going through the motions, right? So the other one was called the uh, Access for Justice for Bank Victims Inquiry. That committee gave the bank victims 10 days to put in a submission, which is next to no time. At least we had two months. They did hold hearings, which we're not going to be getting, but now they've, they re, the report was released on uh, Monday from that, from that inquiry, and the, the, it's a, the, a bank victim has, leader has described it as a bitter disappointment, right? These people, they, they just think that um, because there's the public, here's the vested interest of the banks, which is the most powerful one, they can continue to orient to them and ignore the public. And what they're hoping will happen is the public will get so demoralised they'll give up, mm. right? This is how the, 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 uh, the political structure works. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. So now, in the case of the separation of bills of banks inquiry, this is something that, the remember, the Royal Commission, everyone was saying, is he going to separate the banks? Is he going to recommend that? And he didn't. And Stephen Long and the ABC on the 4th of March described the lockup on the 4th of February, and he describes how... The Bankers Association boss, Anna Bly, a former Labor Premier, right? She's, she's hunched over the report, reading it, and after about half an hour, he said she sits back, relaxed, she looks around the room, he said the tensions in her shoulders visibly slipped away, and she she, the, bankers, the banks had nothing to worry about, right? The report was good for them. Mm -hmm. Is that what should have happened to the banks after all the revelations from the Royal Commission? No, of course not. So and the main thing was, they were saying, they were looking, are we going to be separated? And they weren't. That was the big thing. When the news got out they weren't, their share price soared. However, a week later, Pauline Hanson went into the Senate and introduced the separation of banks bill. Because it's not up to, Hank can recommend it or not, it's up to the parliament what happens to the banks, right? And this is the bill that we drafted. Let's separate these things. It's the same, it's a virtually the same thing that has just been tabled in the US Congress. So now there's this inquiry, but it's chaired by a banker, Jane Hume, with other bankers on the inquiry. What have they done? Well, we know they're being flooded with submissions. Their own website says that from a week ago, they said they've got 350 as of then. Well, they've got a lot more now. They're probably going to have well over 1,000. But they've said they're only going to publish 30. 30. Right? 30. 30, that's right. Right? Now, what that does, it suppresses two things. The demonstration of public support for the bill, right? Just totally suppresses it. It's deliberate. It's, 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 it's a, it equates to censorship. It suppresses the expert opinions that have been put to this committee by real experts. And we know there's a bunch of experts in Australia that have made submissions. There's a bunch of experts from around the world, Craig, that have made submissions, right? They should all be put up there because then those expert opinions can be balanced against the mealy mouth, pathetic excuses from Treasury and APRA and the RBA and the banks and the Bankers Association of why they shouldn't be broken up, right? Let the people choose between the two expert opinions. But they, um, so they, they get to suppress that. Right. This is a real democracy, isn't it, Robert? You know, this is uh, this in is a real democracy. You know, exactly. people people have you know these these ideals of a democracy. It all should be open for public scrutiny. Yep. It should all be there for people to make up their mind. In this great democracy in Australia, this is what should happen, shouldn't it? That's right. That's but right. it doesn't. Now we know um, uh, we've, a lot of CSC supporters have been calling the members of this committee, and everyone, all the other members of the committee, have said the same thing. Jane Hume's in charge. She's a virtual dictator. She gets mm -hmm. because the Liberals have the majority. She gets to make all these decisions. And she so got in there very when she got in there very. She was quickly promoted to this. It wasn't some small. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. That's uh, that slipped my mind. Small period of time. No, this is Jane Hume was elected as a senator in the 2016 election, which was the middle of the year, July 2016. 
Parliament first sat in September 2016. The minute she sits in Parliament, she has put as the chair of this committee. And why this committee? This is the committee that oversees legislation related to banking. Mm -hmm. So they brought in a high-powered banker into the Senate. She straight away made the chair of this committee where she can make these kind of decisions. So she's, she's suppressing the, um, uh, the, the submissions. They are refusing to hold public hearings, right? When, again, if they hold public hearings, they would actually have to listen to these experts who are prepared to come and tell them why Glass-Steagall and separation is so important. They're refusing to do that. The other thing that's become a real drama is the time, thanks to the time of the election, the submissions close tomorrow. The reporting date of this inquiry is the 13th of May. Yeah. Well, now the election's on the 18th of May. This, this, th these senators are supposed to go through the reading of these submissions, formulating an opinion, writing a report in the middle of an election campaign. Well, that's impossible. Mm. So if this is a sincere inquiry, okay, they have an option available. Extend the reporting date. They don't have to stick to the 13th of May. They can make it two or three months after the election date. And that'll give them more time, actual time to hold hearings. So far, there is no indication they're prepared to do that, right? And so all these things are disgusting displays of contempt for the public. And like I said before, though, they want you, the, Republic, the public, to be demoralised. So you, you, give a, you give up and go away and think nothing will ever change. No, don't give them what they want, right? What we have to do is keep at them, wear them down. Don't let them wear you down, you wear them down. So what we're asking people to do is, um, uh, instead, of, hopefully by now you, you, you did make your submission, get onto our website, there's numbers there, call the members of this committee and demand they hold hearings. But then the other thing to do is take, get, call in and get a copy if you haven't got it, of this legal opinion that Bob Butler, the solicitor, did on bail-in. Call in and, and, and get any backup material you need on Glass-Steagall itself and separation of banks itself. Make it your business as a citizen to go and confront every candidate in your electorate, all of them. There'll be a dozen or so in every electorate, right? Labor, Liberal, National, all, so definitely the major ones, but all of them. Front them all up on this question of bail-in and the separation of banks, right? Let's make, we will bring this reality to bear that the politicians aren't wanting to talk about. So that whoever gets elected in this election, by the time they take their seats, this will be ringing in their ears, right? And we'll be able to escalate again post-election. So that's, that's, the, that's the CEC strategy for now. Um, we better take a break, Craig, and when we come back, we're gonna talk about the, the economic reality that makes this so urgent. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Countdown to economic Armageddon. So, Craig, before the break, we were talking about the Glass-Steagall Senate inquiry. Why do we need Glass-Steagall? For the same reasons that uh, Franklin Roosevelt brought it in 1933, Robbie. We've got to protect the legitimate banking system. That is the necessary commercial banking system we need for commerce and trade inside our economy. We've got to get rid of the, the speculation and all the, 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 the toxic elements of our banking system by breaking the banks apart into the necessary commercial banking and the rest of it has to be basically you know, pushed aside, written off or whatever. That's what Glass-Steagall does. It's a political fight. It's not the mechanisms have been done before as yeah. Roosevelt did in 33. It's purely the political awareness, uh, the will to, to do this has to be made absolutely urgent and it needs to be done before we get into a full-scale economic collapse. Otherwise, we're going to end up in chaos. And it's the viewer out there that's going to suffer, suffer massively, because if it's not controlled, if we don't have a protected banking system that controls and is able to direct the economy with a national bank and other policies that the CEC re re represents in our, in our five-point uh, program, then you know we're going to end up in a real mess. And that's the issue that we're going to go through now, because as I said at the top of the show, you know, the, the election is a joke so far. All they're talking about electric cars. They need to be talking about this reality. You know, if, 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 it, was a, if it was an American election in August 2008, can we all look back and say they should have been talking about the, the financial crash that was about to happen? Well, to, to pay it, take it seriously, because that's what's looming right now. So here's the very latest. The IMF has um, shocked Australia, or those who are paying attention this week, its economist for Australia, whose name is Thomas Hebling, he admitted that the property collapse in Australia is 
faster and worse than the IMF expected, and they have to revise their forecast for Australia as a result of that. And, and the point, one of the reasons this is so significant, Craig, is that property growth, this, this bubble in property, that has been responsible for virtually all Australian economic activity for the last half mm. decade since mm. the, um, the, uh, the, the mining boom yeah. ended, right? So construction, et cetera, all on the back of this. There's a, there's a, there's a massive knock-on effect about to happen, and the IMF is, is uh, conceding that. Moody's, the ratings agency, which, you know, they, they, they're, a, they're a joke half them, but they, they keep producing these reports. Sometimes they start to catch up with reality. So Moody's has, re has revised its property forecasts for the, the big markets of Melbourne and Sydney. They're now forecasting a further 10% fall in Sydney. And remember, Sydney's already down 14 to 15%. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an average. So that's a lot higher in some places. And a further 12% fall in Melbourne this year. And then when you know that, Robbie, they've already understated it because they can't exactly. really state what they actually believe. Well, all these forecasts are always, so they make a forecast that was, it started off as 5% down, then 10% down, then 15% down, then 20% down. And, and the, the market keeps outpacing the forecasts, right? Mm. So, but you're looking at, they're admitting, at least by the end of the year this year, it's going to be 20% down. Well, it's going to be 20% down before that, right? And when that happens, by, people will, will be start really starting to panic. Um, this is important, Craig. The Irish are looking at Australia, and the, and the Irish are saying, well, we know what a, a banking crash looks like, and it's you. <laughs> There's a, a financial expert in Ireland named Eddie Hobbs has written in the Irish Examiner on the 9th of April, are we seeing early signs of an Australian debt asteroid strike and why it matters? I'll just read some of the, the quotes from that article. He, he's, 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 he's monitored the, um, the reporting in Australia. He goes, Eddie Hobbs says, a recent report by Denise Braley, who we've had on this show, Craig, the president of the Australian Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association, to a Royal Commission on Banking provide the worrying picture of banking in Australia. Her research and findings on the dark arts of some debt sales down under reverberated more widely for a reason. It can happen in parts of a banking, of banking in a hot market. How widespread, however, is uncertain. Braley claims that in 70% of her cases, borrowers were unaware they'd been sold an interest-only mortgage until nasty letters started to arrive. Back in 1993, during the Irish uh, endowment mortgage scandal, when half of all new mortgages were being sold on an interest-only basis, the same gulf in information was the most frequent complaint I recorded. Fast, he continued, fast forward in 2019, over 40% of Australia's big home loan book is out on interest only deals. Despite government attempts to rebalance the market in favour of home buyers and the likelihood of a new government adding further measures, the worry is that it may be too late. Ireland took 69 months to fall, 55%. That's back in 2008. The US took 63 months to fall 32%. Spain took 78 months to fall 37%. According to economist Leith Van Onselen, formerly of the Australian Treasury and Goldman Sachs, the slope of the Australian decline to date is not as steep as Ireland's, but it is steeper than the USA and Spain. Whether this morphs into a systemic crisis and economic Armageddon flagged this month by independent economist John Adams is not yet clear, but some of the spillover effects are startling. On, and then he goes through, um, I'll skip a few things, and then, then, then this is what he concludes. The worst case scenario is that Australia could be the location of the next crater for the IMF to fret over, and the first since Cyprus in 2012 to experience haircuts on deposits. Let's take a break and we'll continue afterwards. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report, where we're discussing countdown to economic Armageddon, which, of course, as Craig said before the break, this is the reason we need Glass-Steagall and we need it urgently to, to separate the banks so that we're protected from the consequences of this speculation. So before the break, Craig, I was just reading out some of the quotes from this um, uh, uh, Irish expert, Eddie Hobbs, talking about um, an Australian asteroid debt strike, he calls it. Um, now, other... other other point is, though, last week uh, you and Elisa on our show covered the fact that John Adams, the economist that Eddie quoted, he, had, he went public with information to say, look, our Treasury sent a delegation to Europe in February to talk to the countries that had a banking crisis in 2008 to find out in detail how they handled it, right? Yep. So if the Treasury's doing that, are they, are they making that clear to the public? No, they, they're not. And, of course, some people would argue, well, of course, they wouldn't do that. But the point is... 
that shows you that um, when they're telling you, oh, the, our economy is in great shape, etc., they're not even believing it, right? There's a global dimension to this as well uh, that just has to be mentioned. One of the real issues that people don't understand about the banking system, Craig, is derivatives. This is what the, a lot of most speculation is centered in. In fact, it's tied up in the bank in the housing bubble, for instance, because the only reason the bubble, the derivative the housing bubble got so big is because the banks could gamble in deriv derivatives on the bubble. Well, get this, in Wall Street, the biggest banks there have just released their annual reports. And in their own annual reports, these banks, which were not made to change their derivatives practices after the crash, when they should have been, have admitted that the derivatives that they're gambling in could bring down the global financial system. <laughs> I mean, they just they, they admit it in their report. I'll read you a quote in a second, but just just to give you a sense of their derivatives, our Australian derivatives collectively, thirty-seven trillion dollars of derivatives across all of Australia, right? Australia's banks. J.P. Morgan Chase, one bank, has forty-eight point two trillion U.S. in derivatives. That's probably more like fifty-five trillion for us. No, Sixty. Sixty. Yeah. Citigroup has forty-seven trillion in derivatives. Bank of America, thirty-one point seven trillion. Goldman Sachs, forty-two point three trillion. Get this from J.P. Morgan's annual report. Quote, J.P. Morgan Chase could incur significant losses arising from concentrations of credit and market risk. J.P. Morgan Chase regularly monitors various segments of its credit and market risk exposures to assess the potential risks of concentration or contagion, but its efforts to diversify or hedge its exposures against those risks may not be successful. So, Craig, with everything I've just gone through, we've got two choices break up the banks, separate them, inoculate the system against this kind of thing, protect people and their deposits from that and not, and not let the banks do that again, yeah. or bail in. What should we choose? Well, obviously, Robbie, I think people say, I'll leave my deposits alone, right? Look, the issue here is a political one. And at the moment, there's a lot of political denial about the reality of what's coming up and it's all masked by the election, right? Yeah. The fact is that we've been on this, this subject now for nearly six years since the Cyprus events where people couldn't believe that the international model was going to be to steal people's deposits. And a lot of the politicians that are in there now still don't want to believe that that's the case. And the, the media. And the media, yeah. Ian Rogers of Bankers Day, formerly from the <coughs> AFR, called us eccentric this week for claiming this. Yeah, and look, if they keep pushing this line that we're wrong from the point of view of, you've done a detailed analysis of exactly, and we've done a lot of detailed analysis of why this is the case, they're all covering that up. At the end of the day, it's not going to be them that really lose it. It's going to be the ordinary people. It's going to be the economy. It's going to be, and we're already seeing the, the slowdown yeah. in the economy because of the slowdown in the construction industry. I mean, as you said before, when the boom is finished, which it is finished with the housing industry, and you start to lose tens of thousands of carpenters, electricians, plumbers, and all the people associated with that, what does that do to the internal economy? It begins yep. to collapse. And this is not something you can turn around in a hurry unless you've got control of your financial system through Glass-Steagall. You control your banks, you control the emission of credit. That means we would have a national bank which controls the private banks, and then you'd emit, emit large amounts of credit into productive industries, into your farm, into manufacturing, and, and you know, large-scale infrastructure development projects and so forth. You have to have a non-monetarist approach right. to how you run an economy. We've, put, we've had 40 to 50 years of monetarism in this country, and this is where it's got us to. And that'll stop the bubbles from happening again, is the well, other thing. That, that's all part of monetarism, yeah. All right, so, Craig, thanks very much. Let me end by repeating... Don't let the politicians and their subservience to the banks, etc., that disgust you. Don't let that wear you down. You wear them down, right? They need interaction with the public to balance the vested interests. Keep the fight up. That's it for this week's CEC report.